a dark room, isn't it? It's also amazing what happens when you let Jesus take control. I don't know what your journey is this morning and what brought you here to this service, but I hope you know one thing is true, is that Jesus loves you. And although that phrase may be candid and we may have learned it all of our life and heard it all of our life, but we wanted to bring this whole service down just to this one moment of intimate, of intimacy, of an intimate time to declare that Jesus is Lord. He's the Savior of the world, and as big as that sounds, he's as personal as sitting right in this chair right here. I want us to sing a song that we all grew up singing about this time of the year. We grew up sitting in front of a fireplace singing this song, so I know you know it. But there's nothing more powerful in the unity of worship to Jesus. Amen. raise our candles high and sing this last verse to him. Jesus. 
Jesus, you are the light of the world. It's always about you, and it always will be. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. Well, Merry Christmas. How are you? Man. What an incredible day it is for us to be able to come together and celebrate the birth of Jesus. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so grateful. Those of you who are joining us live online, we're enamored by all the responses we've gotten back with the Christmas services so far. We're excited that we have the chance to celebrate. You know, Christmas is a lot of things to a lot of different people. But at the very core of Christmas, it's a story of a father's love that is so great for his children that he sends his son so that we might have a relationship with him. And it's a beautiful story, and it's an amazing story, and it's a story that that God hardwired into our hearts. And it's a great time for us to celebrate. Um, This Christmas season, what I want to do, though, and what we're going to do at that church is something just a little bit different. What we want to do is is we want to bring out one of the storylines of the Christmas story that you may not have thought about, and that's the storyline of missed opportunities. You know, as we think about and consider the story of Jesus and the birth of Christ, what we have to be also made aware of is that a lot of people missed it and and still are. There's a lot going on right now concerning the holiday of Christmas, isn't there? I mean, it's all over the place. I mean, we see all kinds of celebrations, whether it's getting things or coming together or over food or whatever. But at the same time, though, the real purpose and meaning behind Christmas can easily be set aside by all of us. Not just, And I'm not just talking about the commercial world. I'm talking about those of us even who know Christ sometimes miss out on what God really wants us to know and be concerned about when it comes to Christmas. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about missed opportunities. If you go all the way back to the first Christmas, that very first Christmas, there were people who missed out. There was an innkeeper. He missed out. I mean, think about it. Maybe later, if, if maybe if he, uh, you know, met Jesus face to face, I mean, think about it. He would have to face him and he goes, hey, what's up? You, I, you didn't have no room for me. You know, you, you missed out. Or, or, or how about the religious people in Jesus' community in that day? They missed out. They, they knew the story of Jesus, but they didn't know Jesus was coming. They didn't know he was that close or that near. What if, what if today, this Christmas, you're living a life that's with missed opportunities. What, what, if, what if maybe you're, you're close to some things, but you're not close to Him, and maybe you don't really know what God is offering you? I pray today as we enter into this message together that we're going to lay down a life in front of you, someone you can look at, and we're going to examine his life. And as we do, I pray that you may begin to connect the parallels between his missed opportunities and your missed opportunities. And, and what I pray is more than that, not only do you recognize and see them, but I pray that as you recognize how you're missing out on something that God has for you, that you'll make an adjustment in your life and you'll move yourself in a position to where God can do some things in and through you that you never, never really thought possible. That's really what Christmas should be about. Our story um, this morning is going to begin with a king. His name is Herod. Now, Herod was a great king, according to all of historians. He wasn't great because he did wonderful things. He was great because he was a great constructor. He loved building things. The Roman government had put him in charge of of large provinces in Israel, um, and he was in charge of a lot of Jewish people. And Herod built and constructed lots of stuff. He rebuilt the temple. He, rebuilt, he built a city called Caesarea Maritime, which is an incredible, beautiful work of art. He brought art and education and entertainment to every city that he was the king over. And people loved him. They, they enjoyed what he brought to them. What most didn't know is that Herod had a purpose behind why he was doing all of this construction. It was this one thing. When he looked at the Hebrew and the Jewish people and he saw that they had a faith in God, he said, you know what? That faith in God is holding them back. Their faith in God is keeping them from really experiencing success. And so Herod built things and brought education and brought culture and all of these things in hopes that the Jewish people would give up on this faith in God, this pursuit of this ancient God. He hoped that they would let go of that. Then Herod had a son. 
Herod's son was, when he was born, he was born like lots of other babies, like our babies as well, born with the brightness of that youthful moment. I mean, if you're a parent, you know what it's like when that baby first comes into the world and how excited you are. We dream during that time, don't we? Herod, no doubt, he and his young wife would have been dreaming about their son as well. And they were coming up with ideas about what he was going to be. See, we, we have all kinds of big dreams for our kids when they're young, the brightness of our youth. When was the last time you spoke to a parent who had a young child and you said, man, what do you think he'll be one day? Most people don't say criminal. Well, a few maybe, but most don't. <laughs> Most don't say homeless. Most don't say, you know, washed up. Most don't say he's going to be broke or she's going to be a mess. Most of us, when our kids are little, we have the brightness of their youth and we're optimistic. We say things like, well, maybe one day he'll be or she'll be a doctor or maybe one day an NBA star or an astronaut or something. We dream when our kids are little. Herod the Great, when his son was born, had a dream for his son. He and his wife both did. They dreamed of their son one day being a king. How do we know that? They named him after his father. They named him Herod. And so from that point forward, they knew that this child, this baby, was going to be something special. And they worked on that. These young parents would work with their kid, and they would press him forward into a future. The problem is, is our potential is not recognized because of the brightness of our beginning. Our potential isn't recognized. It isn't realized because we were born. Most often, our potential is realized because of our parents, at least at first. See, Herod, young Herod, would be guided. He would be driven by his mom and dad. In fact, the Bible says it this way. The Bible says in Proverbs 22 and 6, it says, Direct your children in the right path, and when they're older, they'll not leave it. The truth is, is that our parents have a big responsibility. Those of you who are parents have big responsibilities in where your children are going to go. Herod the Great would guide his young son, Herod, in a certain direction. And here's what the older Herod would tell his son. Son, don't waste your time on God. Don't waste your time on real... That's going to hold you back. If you're going to be king one day, if you're going to be successful one day, focus on your education. Focus on getting things. Focus on making the right relationships. Focus on becoming a great leader because that's the most important thing. Don't waste your time on God. And unfortunately... Young Herod would never be exposed to the value and the importance of a God who created all things. He would not be exposed to a God who loves us in an incredible way. He would not be exposed to the fact that the God who created us also has a purpose for our lives. And so this young Herod, the brightness of his youth would come and go along with its opportunities. And Herod would go on in life without being aimed by his parents in the right direction. He would go in a different direction. We fast forward the story just a little bit, and we're going to go a little further into the future. At this point, we're we're no longer dealing with a young or a child Herod, but now we're, we're dealing with a man. He's no longer just any man. Now he's king. He's not walking in his father's footsteps. He's literally in his father's shoes. He has taken over what his father left behind. Herod is powerful. Herod is a king. I don't know if you've noticed this, but so often power Money and success oftentimes extracts out of us the worst parts of us, doesn't it? It reveals the things about us. If you ever want to know what someone's really made of, give them success. Give them power, and you'll start to see who they really are. Well, Herod, the moment that he became king, this young Herod that is now King Herod, when he becomes king, the first thing he does is he divorces his wife, and he moves towards an upgrade. He doesn't look after just any woman. He finds a woman that he can reach out to, and it's actually his brother's wife, He woos her away from his brother, and he marries her in a very public way. In Herod's community, there's an evangelist. He's the the last prophet. His name is John the Baptist. And because this sin is so public, John the Baptist takes it up in a very public way. He begins to condemn the behavior of Herod and his new wife, Herodias. In fact, the Bible says it this way in Mark chapter 6 and verse 18. It says, John had been telling Herod, it's against God's law for you to marry your brother's wife. Man, that's a confrontation to take. Herod is powerful. He's the king. He, can, he could take John's life, but he doesn't. And Herod has to listen to what John has to do. See, it's at that moment in our life sometimes where our life collides with God's truth. And maybe you haven't lived at that moment yet. Maybe you haven't lived through it yet. But at some point in our life, our life and the direction we want to go with our life, at some point will collide with the truth of God. And very often, God calls us to do something different than maybe what we want to do or what we intended to do. 
And God calls into question the direction that we're taking with our life. That's exactly what happens with Herod. John the Baptist comes to him with God's truth, and he says, Herod, I know this is what you want to do. I know this is what you'd like to do, but it's contrary to what God is teaching. It's contrary to God's law, and you have to make a change. There's a churchy word that we use for this particular transaction. It's called conviction. Conviction is when God points something out in our life, makes apparent to us something in our life that needs to change. Conviction is that that feeling that we have, that gut-level feeling where we go, something needs to change. I hear what's being said, and then we have to do something with it. Conviction causes people to do strange things, crazy things. I've seen people join churches because they were under conviction. I've seen people become Sunday school teachers or lead small groups or even elevate themselves to some level of leadership in the church. I've I've seen people decide to attend churches more consistently because of conviction. Very often, though, that conviction, the only thing we really need to do with it is turn to God and make sure our life is in line with Him. Herod did a lot of things when he was under conviction. Here's what the Bible says about what he did. Mark chapter 6, verse 20. It says, For Herod respected John. It's interesting that Herod didn't like what John had to say. But he respected him as a person. And it goes on to tell us why. And knowing that he was a good and holy man. So John is going to get in Herod's face and say, But Herod, this is not the way God has called you to live. It's not the way he designed you to live. This is not what God wants for you. And Herod doesn't really like that, but he respects him. Why? Because John's a holy man. See, Herod operates in a realm of people that weren't very honest. And Herod had plenty of friends around him that would tell him what he wanted to hear But he had very few friends around him that told him what he needed to hear. John the Baptist was one of those few. And it really caused Herod to respect him. Although Herod didn't know what to do or wouldn't do what he needed to do with what John told him, he still respected what he had to say. It goes on to say that Herod even protected John. He protected him. Why? Anybody who's, who is disciplined in sharing truth with people are going to gather for themselves some enemies. You're going to have some haters. There's going to be some haterade being drank in the community, I promise you. And so John the Baptist certainly had some people that didn't like him. Why? Because he had some things to say that no one wanted to hear. No one wanted to hear that. But Herod protected him because he saw that he was a holy man. It goes on to say this. Herod was greatly disturbed whenever he heard John. I don't know if you found yourself in a circumstance where maybe God's truth has confronted your life and you don't feel good about it. You feel disturbed about it. But what God's asked you to do is something that you're not necessarily willing to do. Maybe what God's asked you to do has a sacrifice involved with it. Maybe what God's asked you to do has a confrontation, maybe in a relationship. Then you don't really want to do that. So you feel disturbed. That's where where Herod was. He was tossed up. He was in the tension of the middle of what God had asked him to do, but what he wanted to do or maybe what he felt like he had to do. And that tension was was tangible. It says he was disturbed whenever he talked to John, but even so, he liked listening to him. See, conviction causes us to do a lot of things. I've seen people do all kinds of things in hopes that that conviction would go away. See, God calls us into a relationship with Him. God calls us into obedience with Him. And so often we do a lot of other things. We do, matter of fact, everything other than doing that sometimes. And so Herod, he, he respected John. He protected John. He was even disturbed by what John had to say. But the one thing Herod never did at this point in his life is he never changed. He walked away from John's message. And he heard it. But he didn't do the one thing that he needed to do, and that was change. Of all the things that bother me as a pastor the most is I think about the people who gather. And sometimes people look at our church and they go, man, a lot of people go to church there. And that's awesome. It's great. But, But that's not my greatest aspiration as a pastor. And that's not the greatest goal of that church is to have a bunch of people here. Our greatest goal is that people might hear the truth of God. And understand that God has the absolute best way we, are, we should live. That God has every right to tell us how to live. And my greatest aspiration is not that this room be full of people, but this room be filled with people who hear God's message and say yes to God. And put their life directly in the middle of God's will and put their life in God's hands, even though that may cost them something, even though that may be complicated, even though that may be hard, even though that may be scary, they do that. Because when we go through life like Herod did and we hear God's truth, but we do nothing about it to turn to Him, we miss an opportunity And at this point in Herod's life, the opportunity was gone and it was closed. You know, the truth is, is our life is the product of the choices that we make. If you look at kind of where you are right now, and and regardless of how you started, you're you're pretty much the product of the decisions and the choices that you've made with your life. And, And Herod was no different. Herod was making lots of choices. He was making decisions about God all along the way. Herod now has been king for a short while. 
His wife Herodias, who was his brother's wife, now his wife, he's kept her. John the Baptist hasn't closed his mouth. He kept talking about it. He kept, he kept confronting it. Well, Herodias, Herod's wife, hates John the Baptist. She doesn't just dislike him. She wants him dead. She can't stand this guy. But Herod, he doesn't want John the Baptist dead. So Herod feels like he can do that one thing and stay in the middle of it. So he takes John the Baptist and he puts him in jail, hoping that his wife, would, would, that would appease her, that she would be okay, that she would let go of her anger. But she doesn't. Herodias just waits for the opportune time for her to get John the Baptist. And the opportunity comes. There's a party in the palace. Herodias has a young daughter. Her name is Salome. Salome is beautiful and she is intriguing. She can dance. She comes out at this great banquet party at the palace and she entertains everyone with the most intriguing and beautiful of dances. All of the guests in Herod's kingdom at that point at the party are just enamored by the beauty of this young lady and her dance. Herod is so captivated and taken by her that when she finishes dancing, Herod, in a, a moment of spontaneity, says, because of what you've done, because of the, how you've entertained us, you can have anything you want in the kingdom, even up to half of the kingdom. Salome leaves, and she goes to her mother, Herodias, and she says, Herodias, she says, Mom, what should I ask for? Herodias tells her young daughter, she says, you ask for the head of John the Baptist. I want him dead. She says, you go back in there right now while the guests are still there. And I want you to go in there and I want you to ask for the head of John the Baptist. Before anybody leaves, you go ask for it. Salome returns to the party and she stands in front of everybody. and She says, I know what I want. And King Herod says, what is it? She said, I want the head of John the Baptist. And in, in Mark chapter 6, verse 26, it says, Then the king deeply regretted what he'd said. But because of the vows that he'd made in front of his guests, he couldn't refuse her. Reality is this, is that there are going to come a point in your life where God's going to ask you to be or do something that the people around you may not understand. And I think there's this tension sometimes that you and I live in when, when God has asked us to make a decision. He's put a calling on our life. He's asked us to live in a different way that we know that if we really pursue God, we're going to have to have a hard conversation with a relationship or we're going to be misjudged by our friends. And we talk about peer pressure just being a high school thing, but the truth is peer pressure exists at every stage in life, doesn't it? especially today. And so some of us are here and God has asked us to do something different, to live differently, to, to live above where we are. He's called us to it. But we're concerned about what this other person might think. What's my wife going to think? What's my boyfriend going to think when I tell him we're not going to live this way anymore? What are, are my friends going to stop wanting to hang out with me because I'm not going to do what they're doing anymore? Will it look like I'm judging everybody because I've chosen to follow God? And this pressure, it mounts on us. And your enemy wants you to feel that pressure. He wants you to believe that what everybody else thinks is somehow more important than what God thinks. That's where Herod exists. And a choice has to be made at that point. Herod had to make a decision. Am I going to please everybody around me? Or am I going to please the one who made me and the one who can save me? Unfortunately for Herod, it goes on to say, so he immediately sent an executioner to the prison to cut off John's head and bring it to him. The soldiers beheaded John in the prison and brought the head on a tray and gave it to the girl who took it to her mother. I remember sitting in a church service in a contemporary church not too long ago, and I remember the pastor saying this. He said, you know, back years ago, pastors used to use scare tactics. and used to try to scare people into a relationship with God. He said, I just don't believe that's the way we ought to do things. When you hear the truth and it scares you, is that a scare tactic? It's not. I want to tell you that the Bible has more to say about warning us about our future without God than any other theme in all of Scripture. It's not because God is trying to scare us. It's because God wants you to know the truth. And the moment that your life is on a crash course, a collision course with the truth, we have a decision to make. Herod had a decision to make, and so do you. And, and today, I want to say this to you. The moment that Herod had the head cut off of John the Baptist, as I see Scripture and as I study Scripture, that was the last time anybody would ever talk to him about God again. I don't know how many chances we have. 
I really don't. And one of the reasons why we take advantage of Christmas as we have this Christmas to share you, with you this heavy message. Certainly we could, have a, we could have a super positive message where everybody leaves here, man, oh, we're so, it was so awesome, wasn't that great? And we just smile and we can suck on a candy cane and look at tomorrow. <laughs> but that's not the responsibility of the church. That's not my role. My role is to bring at least attention and put in front of you this reality that you don't have unlimited opportunities to put your life in the hands of God. You live but one time, and it is but a vapor, James says, and you have choices to make. King Herod had a choice to make, and the choice that he made to kill John the Baptist killed his last opportunity to say no to God, and God accepted it. Of all the things that should create the most intrepidation in any of us, it should be the thought that God at some point will accept my no. When I turn my back on him this last time and I walk away from him, the most frightening thing to me is for God to say, okay, I'll let you go. I hear you. And Herod has John's head cut off. And no one talks to God, talks to John about God ever again for the rest of his life. The timeline pushes forward. Herod's still alive. He's still still existing. He's still pressing on. In John chapter 6 and verse 44, Jesus tells us a narrative about God that you and I need to know. See, there's a false idea today that you and I can come to God anytime that we want to. You can't. You can't. See, the truth is, is that you won't come to God on your terms. You'll come to God on His terms. And that's the only way it will work. See, the truth is, and I want you to listen to the words of Jesus in John chapter 6 and verse 44. Listen to what Jesus says. Jesus said, no one can come to me unless, huge word, unless the Father who sent me draws them. See, the false idea that we have today is is if I'm alive, I can call on God anytime I want to call on God. That's not true. That's not true. See, the last time you say no to God, God does not speak to you about himself never again. Herod had said no to God. He had had John the Baptist's head cut off. Jesus is on trial. Pontius Pilate no longer wants to be responsible for Jesus. He says, now this is not mine. He pushes Jesus away. And Jesus goes to King Herod. He stands before this King Herod that we have followed through his life. Jesus Christ is in front of him. And listen to what the scripture says. It says, now Herod was very glad when he saw Jesus. Why? Why was he so excited to see Jesus? Because maybe, just maybe, the voice of God that he'd heard so long in his life had grown silent when he killed John the Baptist. And maybe he missed it. I don't know if you can look back on a remarkable time in your life and say, there was a point in my life where, man, I was on fire for God. Or there was a point in my life where this used to bother me doing this. It doesn't bother me anymore. Maybe you haven't even noticed, but God's grown silent in your life. Maybe you didn't even see it and you didn't know it happened, but right now you're beginning to realize that there's a point in your life where the voice of God grew silent. And maybe like Herod, you you miss it. And so Herod begins to question Jesus. Why? Because he, he missed that voice. I want you to hear something, and if you don't let anything else enter your thought processes this Christmas, let this enter it. In Luke chapter 23, the Bible says, And Herod questioned Jesus at some length. Herod wanted to hear from God again. The the voice was silent. He he wanted to hear from God. I I need to hear from him. See, Herod was still alive physically, but spiritually, he had died. Herod questioned him at some length, but Jesus answered him, nothing. We don't have unlimited opportunities to put our life in God's hands. We have but one lifetime. The last time we say no to God, God doesn't speak to us anymore. You know, we have traveled with Herod's life. We've traveled with him through his life at, until the end. And, and it's easy to pick out where he didn't surrender himself to God, where he didn't take advantage of his opportunities. 
You and I have to understand that this, on this particular Christmas, this year, you have an opportunity. You know what you don't have to do? Can I tell you? The, let me give you the good news. You want the good news? Someone says, how do I know the Father's drawing me? If you've got a knot in your throat right now, if you have, a, have something in your stomach, if you feel in your belly like, ugh, you know what? My life, I've not been, I've not put myself in God's hands. If you feel right now, you feel the conviction of the Spirit of God saying, hey, this is a reality for you. you or you're living like Herod. You're doing the same thing. And as your life is progressing on, you feel and experience that that's the Spirit of God drawing you. See, I didn't come to know Jesus as my Savior because I was smart, because I figured it all out. I came to know Christ as my Savior because just like you, God began to deal with me. God began to work in my life. God told me this story of Jesus, the man who came and died for my sins, was true. And I heard the voice of God, not audibly, but inside of me saying, Scott, you need to believe this story. You need to trust this Savior so that you might be saved. I experienced that. And at some point in my life, when I was seven years old, I said yes to the Lord. You, this Christmas, have that opportunity. If you sit here today and the Spirit of God has dealt with you, that is the Father drawing you. That's God saying, hey, listen, I love you. I want you to know the gravity of the decisions that you make. I want you to know that you don't have unlimited opportunities. You have, you have but this lifetime to make a decision, and you don't have the whole lifetime. Herod didn't even have his whole lifetime to make that decision. I don't know how many times you can turn your back on God. I don't know how many times you can say no to God. I don't know. That number is unannounced, and it's not given to me, nor is it given to you. But I know this. You have this opportunity. You have this moment. You have the privilege of right now because God did come. Listen, God closed the gap between us and him. That's what Christmas is about. The name Emmanuel that we almost never hear except for Christmas time means God with us. God came close. I put a gap between God and I because of my sin. And God walked through that gap and he extended my hand through Jesus. He extended his hand to me. And all I had to do, you know what I had to do? Just accept it. Yes, Lord. I want your forgiveness. Yes, Lord, I want a relationship with you. At any point, Herod could have done the same thing. At any point, but at every juncture, Herod said no. At every opportunity, he said no. I pray this Christmas you don't miss your opportunity. I really do. I want you to listen to the words of the Gospel of John. John chapter 12, verse 36. It says this. It says, believe in the light. But hear this. While you have the light. While you have it. You have it now. You hear me? You have it now. This is not about joining a church. It's not that I don't care that you ever come back here again. I pray that you will. That's awesome. We'd love for you to be in our church family. We don't mean it. But what I'm telling you right now is if you don't have a relationship with God through Jesus, that is so much bigger than joining a church. It's so much bigger than religion. It's so much bigger than a denomination. This is not about a religion today. This is not about you becoming religious today. This is about you entering a relationship with the one who created you. That's what this is about. That's what Christmas is about. It's about your creator coming for you. It's about a God of the universe who wasn't willing to live forever without you. It's about him coming and making this real. Do you think about it? 2,000 years ago, 7,000 miles away, that's when this happened and where this happened, yet God's brought it to you today. Sherwood, Arkansas, and across the internet, God's brought his word to you today so that you might know him. The best Christmas you could ever have is not going to be found with what's under the tree. It's about unwrapping the gift of Jesus and saying, yes, Lord. Man, do you know what forgiveness feels like? Do you know what the peace of God feels like? The disturbance and the turbulence in your life right now that you can't seem to settle. You've tried to solve it with relationships. You've tried to solve it with success. Maybe you've tried to solve it with alcohol or drugs or whatever. You can look far and wide. The solution is only and always Jesus. And so God today has revealed himself to you. I don't even know if you know the excitement that you should have, but for some of you, for the very first time, you're going to put your life in God's hands and you're going to know him. And I promise you, it changes everything, everything. But you have to make a decision. It's your choice. It's your life. God gives you that privilege. And today, you can walk out of this room and you can say, man, oh, that was pretty cool. Good music. Preaching was eh. You can do that. You can say, man, or you can make it about somebody else. You can be sitting here right now thinking, boy, well, I wish so-and-so was here. You could do that and waste this moment. Or you could say, God's dealing with me. I feel it. <laughs> I know it. The Father's drawing me. I realize my times and opportunities are limited. And you can put your life in the hands of an almighty God who loves you and experience what it's like to be forgiven of your sin, to be filled with passion and purpose, and know that this life doesn't end in the grave, but there's something greater than that that God has in store for all, all those who believe. That's what you can do today.
best Christmas you'll ever have. I promise you. I've never met anybody in my entire career as a pastor that I've ever walked into the room that said, man, you know what, Scott, you know what I regret? I regret surrendering my life to Jesus. I've never heard that, not one time. I've had plenty of people say, Scott, you know what I regret most? That I didn't do it sooner. I regret most that I, that I didn't live for the Lord, man. I wasted and squandered this opportunity on all this other stuff that glittered, but it didn't matter. What matters now, I know, is it's my relationship with him. You have that. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me, and we're going to have a word of prayer, and I'm going to give you a chance, and I'll help you. I'm going to help you with it. I'm going to give you a chance to put your life in God's hands. Remember, this is not about joining that church. We don't have membership like that anyway, so it's not what this is about. This is about you having a relationship with the one who made you. The one who came that very first Christmas came for you. He loves you. And he wants a relationship with you. And he wants to fill you with purpose. He does. And you have a chance to do that today. So if you're here right now and you realize, wow, you know what? I don't know that I have a relationship with God. I like that. If there's any question at all, let's deal with it. So if you're ready to put your life in God's hands, you're, you're, you're tired of wasting the opportunities and you're going to take advantage this Christmas of the Christmas opportunity, the gift of Jesus, then what I want you to do with your heads bowed, eyes closed, don't be looking around. I want you just to pray silently with me. Let me help you with the words. Just, why don't you say something to God like this? You don't have to say it out loud because it's not about me and you. It's not about you and the person. This is about you and God. Just say something like this silently. Say, Lord, I realize today I need you. God, I put my life in your hands. I trust that your son Jesus died for me and gave his life for me because of my sin. Jesus, take control of my life. Teach me how to live. Thank you, God, for forgiving me. Thank you, God, for loving me. Thank you, God, for saving me. Today, God, my life will be marked by this belief that I believe that you, Jesus, died for me, you were buried, and you were raised on the third day, just like what the Bible says. And you now are my Lord and my Savior. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, how good it is to be in this place with so many people as we consider the beauty of Christmas, Lord. The significance of the story, God, is that you came for us and the opportunity for us to surrender our life to you is an amazing thing. To live for you, God, not only now but forever. Father, thank you for this. I pray for every person in this room. I don't know what everybody's going through, but God, I pray your strength. I pray your hope. And I pray your your purpose in and on their life, God. Thank you for loving us like you do, God. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, real quick, before you guys get out of here, if you prayed that prayer with me, we would love to send you some information. Listen, we're not going to blow your phone up. We're not going to, you know, text message you to death. I barely even know how to text message. But, but if you'll text I prayed to 77453, everybody be still for just a second. Freeze, freeze. Text I prayed to 77453. We want to send you some information about what the next steps look like, okay? This is not going to be advertisements. We're not going to blow your phone up. I promise you that. I promise you. Promise you. Promise you. And if it's a lie, then you come to me and say, that's, you lied. And I'll fix it. I pray to 77453, and we'll get some information to you. You're leaving now. Christmas is tomorrow. Some of you, for the very first time, you really get to celebrate. You want to know why? Because you have a Savior now. You know the real meaning of Christmas. When you leave this place, be smiling. Hey. Two more things before you go. Be kind to people and tip your waitresses, especially if you leave this place and go eat somewhere right now. All right? Tell them about Jesus. Love you guys.